What Bitcoin Did podcast. Hello there. How are you all doing? Welcome to the What Bitcoin Did podcast, which is brought to you by Kraken. And today I've got an interview with Tua Demista, where we look at his recent report. Bitcoin is in heavy accumulation. But before that, I've got a message from my show sponsors. So first up, we're going to talk about my lead sponsor, Kraken, the only exchange I use now for buying and selling Bitcoin. And yes, they're a sponsor. So obviously you think I'm going to say that, but in working with them over these last few months, I've learned so much about what they do behind the scenes for the industry and how much they care about the industry. And also their recent announcement for Kraken Security Labs with everything that's happened with exchanges being hacked and shady practices, I know I am now partnered with the best exchange out there. And yeah, they're the only exchange I'm using now for buying and selling Bitcoin. Been doing it for a couple of months now, settling all my balances with them, and I couldn't be happier. Also, got a couple of cool things coming up. I'm meeting up with their chief security officer, Nick Pococo. We're going to work on a show looking at security, looking at exchange security, but also personal security, which I think will be super helpful for anyone who wants to listen to that. And also, I recently spoke with their lead product designer. She showed me a whole bunch of the upcoming work and releases for the product, all the work they're doing on design and UX. All I can say is absolutely amazing. I wish I could tell you more, but when this stuff comes out, you're going to absolutely love it. So love Kraken, based on who they are and their ethics, they are the only exchange I'll use. I think even if they dumped me, they'll probably be the only exchange I'd use. So yes, if you want to join me in supporting Kraken, head over to their website, which is kraken.com, which is K-R-A-K-E-N.com. That is kraken.com, which is K-R-A-K-E-N.com. And also my other lead sponsor, BlockFi, you know about them. I've been working with them. It's going to be coming up to a year soon. Probably have to have some kind of anniversary with them. But they are the future of banking with crypto. They've got two products. They've got their crypto back loans and their crypto interest accounts. I've not used the crypto back loans. I haven't had a need, but I know people who have who say it's pretty cool. But I have started using their crypto interest accounts. I put 20% of my Bitcoin in there. I've had my first statement and I'm earning interest with my Bitcoin. So that's super cool. I'm meeting up with the team next week in New York to find out about everything else they're going to be working towards and working on for the rest of the year. Can't wait to feed back on that. But if you are interested in either a crypto back loan or one of their crypto crypto interest accounts, then head over to BlockFi.com, which is B-L-O-C-K-F-I.com. That is BlockFi.com, which is B-L-O-C-K-F-I.com. Okay, so on to my interview with Tour, and this is the third time he's been on the show. So big thanks to Tour for coming back on the show. Always a pleasure to have him. So he recently released a report from his fund, Adamant Capital. It's titled Bitcoin is in Heavy Accumulation, which when I saw it really stood out to me. I knew I had to read it. I've actually read it twice now. It's a super interesting report. It's got a lot of interesting information and data points in there about why he believes Bitcoin is now in an accumulation. So I recommend you check it out. I recommend you read it, possibly even before you listen to the interview. Maybe you can listen to it afterwards. I've put a link to it in the show notes. As I said, I've read it twice and it's full of useful information, but I hope you enjoy the show. If you've got any questions, you know you can reach out to me. And if you are enjoying the podcast, if you want to support what I do, then head over to my website, whatbitcoindid.com, click on the support section. And I also need to say a big thank you to my patron top tier sponsor. That's Rise Wallet, a new way into Bitcoin. There are no signups. You just scan a card and you are holding Bitcoin. To find out more, head over to risewallet.com. Okay, on to the interview. As I said, if you've got any questions, feel free to reach out to me. My email address is hello at whatbitcoindid.com. Hi, Tua. How are you doing? Hey, Peter. How's it going? I'm good, man. I'm good. Saw you recently, didn't I? Yeah, we met in, in Austin. So thanks for coming on again. This is your third appearance. You joint top now with LOP. You're up there. Third appearance. So thank you. Thank you. I'm honored. All right, man. Well, listen, I've read your report. I think it's very interesting. Bitcoin is in heavy accumulation. As uh, I, th- I think as we both said, the term heavy is a strong term, but it really kind of meant something to me. So I kind of dived in. I've read it twice now. I'm pretty convinced, but it'd be good to work through it. So not everybody will know your entire background. And I know you've been on twice before, but because we're going to go through the report, can you just start by telling people who Adamant Capital is? What is your background and the reason you have an expertise in this area and why they should care about your report? Sure, yeah. Adamant Capital is a Bitcoin alpha fund, so that means that we use Bitcoin as a performance benchmark. And I've been doing research in the space since uh, 2011. Uh, I was a um, pretty much a gold-focused macro investor back in 2008, 
uh, and I was always looking for something, uh, some strategy or combination of strategies to protect yourself um, during a financial crisis, especially during inflation, because that's what I saw coming in the long run for both you know, Europe and the U.S., uh, and so when Bitcoin came along, I, I discovered it in, in Buenos Aires. That was um, a really, really intriguing potential answer. And so I've been exploring ever since whether whether Bitcoin could be, you know, one of those fantastic um, answers, fantastic assets to be in, fantastic like safe harbors uh, for a financial crisis. But of course, in the meanwhile, it's become clear that it can be a lot more and it already is more than that. Did you just say you discovered it in Buenos Aires? Yeah, yeah. I don't think I know that story. What's the background there? Yeah, so I was pretty spooked about what was going on in Europe. This is kind of the aftermath of the 2011 crisis. I don't know if you remember, but in 2011, there was the uh, the sovereign bond crisis in Europe. And it looked like several nation states were about to fail on their, their bond payments. And so what usually happens if you look in history books is that rather than actually fail on their bonds, they just uh, print money to to pay for the bills. They print their own money. And so I was really worried, and, and that's why I was in, in Latin America to kind of explore, like, how do people, how do people live and thrive in, in financially uh, volatile times? And so, like, Argentina, every 10 years, they have their, they have their, their collapse. <laughs> and so people are kind of used to it. And, yeah, it was, I had friends there, um, who both introduced me to Bitcoin and also showed how uh, it it um, it can be used to move money across borders, even if it's prohibited to do so, which at the time was the case. Um, that's what happens if if there's high inflation. Governments don't want you to move all your money out of the country. They kind of want to keep it there. So it was the perfect environment. And they they got their Bitcoins by mining it in their basement, like literally because they could not sign up with Mt. Gox because of all these uh, financial restrictions. I think I attended the very first meetup in Argentina, which was a, a barbecue of five people <laughs> in, uh, in 2012. Uh, and then later it, 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 of course, grew. And now it's, it's a huge meetup. Wow. I've never actually been to Buenos Aires. I've, I actually, I don't think I've been to South America. No, I haven't. I should go. You must have had a good Buenos Aires steak then. Yeah, I, I, I stayed there several months. Uh, it's, it's, I mean, it used to be the Paris of, of the South. It used to be very wealthy. Uh, before the Panama Canal, ships had to go all the way around. And, um, and also it was a very prosperous country. Um, it's, um, it, it's the country with the most European heritage of, uh, of Latin America. I think about 60% of the population, maybe more actually, it could be 80, has uh, European ancestors uh, so people call it like the Italy of uh, of the Americas. It's it's you know has amazing architecture, obviously tango, and lots of cultural heritage too, um, and, and it's yeah it's it's a super interesting place. All right, well let's get into the report. As I said, I've read through it twice now. And firstly, can you give me the background to the report? Obviously, this bear market's been playing out, and you've noted you've written two similar reports like this before. So. At what kind of point did you realize, okay, the bear market's happened, it's going to be coming to an end, it's about time to start doing this report? And also, how much work goes into this report? How long does it take? How many people contribute to it? Just to give a kind of background to the effort that's gone into this. So in 2018, we put out a piece in August saying, hey, we don't think this bear market is done. Uh, We don't think $6,000 Bitcoin is going to be the bottom uh, we're expecting sideways and lower prices um, for the, the rest of the year. And so then the question was, when that happened, when Bitcoin broke down and we went all the way almost to 3,000, the question was like, well, what's next? Um, so we started thinking about it. And the original idea was just to do another blog post, like a follow-up piece. Uh, but then it just, as we did the research and um, and we put a lot of work into methodology. So in, in fe- uh, February 2019, we, um, we put out a piece on, on how to value Bitcoin, uh, because I think it's important to, to not only look at price, to really have different angles to, to, to look at Bitcoin. Um, and so, but then the, yeah, the follow-up piece is going to be like a blog post, but it, it kind of kept snowballing to something bigger. And also, I, I started thinking about the weight that I wanted to give this 
And uh, in my mind, reports usually carry more weight than if it's just a blog post. Um, they're able to circulate more. They're more um, able to circulate also in institutional environments because then people just share the PDF. Uh, and also, I, I've, I've only published reports on Bitcoin uh, very few times when I thought I had something important to say. And so the previous reports uh, on on Bitcoin and Bitcoin valuation were in 2012 and 2015. And so we thought it was appropriate to do a follow-up. And yeah, I mean, a lot of work went into it. Um, uh, I've, I've written most of it. Um, Mikhail, my co-founder, contributed a significant amount and also helped a lot with um, just the, the uh, crunching the data and then uh, we also got feedback from probably about 20 analysts in the space on the, on the draft version that we had. And did you say how long it took you to pull together? Uh, I mean, it's hard to say. I, I'd have to look at the, the original medium draft. I would say, I mean, three months, wow. maybe more. Interesting. I mean, I, it's always with these reports, it's like I have a standard of quality that I want to achieve. But then I also feel urgent because now is the time. I don't want to be late. So that's kind of the, the <laughs> that's the struggle. Um, so I'm glad we got it out. Uh, ideally, I would have wanted to publish it earlier, but uh, th- this was the best we could do to, to still have a high quality report. All right, well, let's start working through it. So firstly, Bitcoin is significantly undervalued right now. Correct. If you look at the blockchain and, and you, you, you look at all the Bitcoin at the last time that they ever moved, and then you compare that price with the current price, you can come up with what we call unrealized profit and loss, which of course makes the assumption that every time a Bitcoin moves, um, it, it possibly is sold. But we call that value realization events. So it doesn't even really matter if it's sold or not. It was the owner of that coin had the opportunity to liquidate it at that time. And so we see that as like a psychological marker like that is important. Um, and so then we aggregate that data and then we can tell whether or not in the aggregate, the market is either in the plus and has unrealized profits or in in the red and has unrealized losses. And that will impact sentiment a lot. At least that's, that's what we strongly believe. Um, and so that's how we come up with this sentiment chart, the relative unrealized profit loss in Bitcoin. Um, <clears throat> and... Um, and of course, what we saw was that in, in late 2013, early 2014, there was, there was a lot of unrealized profits, uh, the same in, in, um, in pretty much 2017, uh, summer to the end of 2017, a lot of unrealized profits. And um, investor psychology then is, is kind of the mindset of greed. And then as the bear market sets in, those, those profits reduce but people often still hold on to them. It's only once they go into the negative that um, sentiment really changes and, and especially retail investors give up and walk away. And so the fact that we've had that in Bitcoin, uh, that was what happened in November 2018 when we went from 6,000 to 3,000 in a matter of weeks. Um, that, is, that was the capitulation. And so the fact that that's behind us and that there's significant evidence that... Um, people are both holding Bitcoin um, and accumulating more of them. That's what makes us feel comfortable that uh, this is what, what is known. It's not a new word that we found that we came up with. It's what's known as the accumulation phase um, of this market cycle. Right. So the cycles are driven by whales, essentially. There's like a side aspect of utility, increase in knowledge, increase in institutionalization, all the kind of side points that kind of come along with it. But they always always seem to be secondary to what the whales do. The way I've seen the cycles is that we have a big price move. Then as the price starts to kind of crash, then lots of really interesting things start to happen. Yeah, I think it's it's whenever you want to value something, you have to decide, well, what is the purpose of this thing, of this phenomenon? And then to what extent is it achieving that purpose? Um, and so with Bitcoin, I think a big misconception is that the purpose of Bitcoin is payments. And so the way we measure success is by looking at, you know, what volume in payments is being done. Uh, and, and even though I don't think that's totally worthless to look at it that way, I think you miss a lot if you don't look at Bitcoin as digital gold, really, which is which is um which is quite different, right? It, it, it means that it's being used as a store of value 
and that the longer you hold it, the more you're expressing your desire to, 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 to make use of that function. Uh, and you can measure that in Bitcoin. And so that's why, like when you said the word whale, like that's, that's what I think of as people. It doesn't mean that um, this individual has a lot of Bitcoin necessarily, but just the fact that there's evidence that they've hold on, held on to it for a long time, that becomes more and more meaningful. Um, so you can measure moves in old coins on the blockchain. And so based on that, you can see that every time and the previous all-time high is, is um, achieved again, that's when um, Bitcoin whales um, in the aggregate start dishoarding. That's when it doesn't mean that they sell all their coins, but they start selling some coins. Uh, and we saw that, um, you see that on, on page four in, in 2013, 2014, and then of course at the, in 2017, throughout 2017, um, you know, long-term holders were selling coins. And so when, when whales are, when their selling is exhausted, um, then all what needs to happen is sufficient new demand to come in to create a bottom in the market. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, it does. And have you seen any evidence during these cycles of the volume of Bitcoin that maybe some of these large holders actually hold in terms of number of coins? And what I'm trying to get at is, as we go through cycles, do they tend to end up owning less Bitcoin, but hold more, say, in dollar value? Or do you see there's an actual pattern where they play the cycle so well that they actually increase their number of Bitcoin? And the reason I ask, is kind of twofold. Firstly, is are we seeing a wider distribution of Bitcoin? And also, is there then a potential risk that as the market grows, say, in potential into hundreds of billions again, even trillions, they're going to be some people sat with so much Bitcoin that they have a very strong control over the market? I think the answer is very clearly that uh, we're seeing more and more coins distributed over time. So while you could say, oh, the Gini coefficient of Bitcoin is worse than North Korea, it's Gini coefficient is a measure for uh, income inequality or wealth inequality. Um, you know, yeah, of course you can say that, but that's that was the same with Microsoft stock during the first 10 years. Like not a lot of people owned it and it was only with with the company growing and more people buying it that buying the stock or owning the stock that, that that changed. But yeah, with Bitcoin, I mean, especially with institutionalization, you think about large funds that are um, buying Bitcoin, those funds are representative of thousands uh, or, or eventually even hundreds of thousands of investors. So if a pension fund buys Bitcoin, then they are exposing their entire client base to the asset. So that is just a massive amount of distribution that's that's happening just by virtue of Bitcoin being more and more financialized. And then of course there's the the whales um, who own a lot of Bitcoin. You know, they have to pay the bills, they make mistakes, they I guess occasionally get hacked. Um, they uh, diversify maybe they convert some of their Bitcoin into equity in, in Bitcoin startups or, or completely different places. Um, so, so that is from from both those sides. The uh, the Bitcoins are are more and more distributed in the world. Um, and so, yeah, it's it's of course there is great quote unquote inequality. There's only maybe uh, I don't know what the latest estimates are actually. I think like sixty million Bitcoin holders in the world. But that's going to go, and I believe it's going to go to billions. Um, and so that means that, of course, the, the, the dollar-based net worth of the top Bitcoin holders is going to go up much more than it goes up today. But the distribution is going to be uh, a lot more flat in the long run. And one of the interesting points in there is that, you know, you've talked about potential institutions or pension funds holding Bitcoin. And when they hold Bitcoin, they hold a dollar value of Bitcoin, they at some point will have to realize that value, right? At some point, they would have to sell their Bitcoin to close the fund. And again, I don't really understand this market. But so that's a potential as well. If everybody has to start realizing their value, it will bring the price down. So can you explain how institutions tend to hold assets like this and how they tend to buy and sell and how it affects the market? It depends on what the bent of the institution is. Like if it's an algo hedge fund, which just uh, is market neutral and is always looking at inefficiencies in the marketplace. Uh, and there are a number of 
you know, Bitcoin trading firms from Chicago, for example, um, they just care about about that. And so they don't have meaningful long term exposure um, to Bitcoin. Of course, they probably hold a little they hold it a little more often than they don't. And so if the price goes up, they probably do better. But it's different from directional funds that are um, either wanting to catch the next wave. There are kind of discretionary funds, discretionary managers who are just um, always looking to to sail the next big waves in, in the macro world. And so to them, you know, I don't know, there could be a, a bull market in oil and a bull market in Bitcoin, and they just want to ride both up and then they get out at what they think is the top uh, because they they are focused on you know quarterly results or or, or annual results uh, for those to be positive year after year, and then there is value funds who are just looking to buy something when it's undervalued and then just hold on to it for the long term as long as they think it's still undervalued uh, versus its relative potential, uh, and that's more like you know the Buffetts or the Bill Millers of, of this world. And there is a significant amount of tax efficiency in, in that approach. Uh, if you don't jump in and out all the time, then that's that's going to serve your investors usually in the long run. Um, and then there's also a consideration of, as a fund manager, whether you need your assets to be liquid uh, or not. And so Bitcoin is one of those rare assets that are actually extremely liquid. So it's, it's very easy to move out of um of the asset or back into it and that has the advantage uh is that it's a cushion in 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 bad times so for example if 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 you've levered up to some extent and you you face with margin calls uh, either as an individual or as an investor you can dip into your bitcoin portfolio to to kind of um compensate for that um or i'm trying to think what the other point was um yeah or you could just uh you, it's it's good to have some th- that bitcoin in there because it's easy to redeem like if you have investors who decide to leave the fund you can send them the physical bitcoin or you can just liquidate it very quickly um and so in that sense it's starting to fit better into uh the portfolios of large funds than it used to uh because that liquidation has become a lot easier So one of the interesting things, too, going through your report and hearing you talk about this is I kind of get the realization whenever I do this is how much more mature the Bitcoin market is to any other cryptocurrency in terms of how it is used, how it can be used by institutions or individuals, how many use cases that there are, the technology, the custody. It's light years ahead of any other cryptocurrency. And it then puts me back in that position where I'm going, oh, right, now I get it again. That's why none of these shitcoins have any value. That's why none of them are really worth trading because they're hot potatoes and probably have no future. I assume you get the same feeling because I, I know you're bent with regards to this and things like Ethereum, etc. Well, I mean, I think I've always been a bit of a contrarian when it comes to these altcoins. Like in 2012, 2013, even 2014 like everybody hated them and and i was quite positive at the time in the sense that you know they served a certain function and um uh, and they were probably always going to be around and i i was still arguing that i thought bitcoin would would have 80 percent of the long-term you know market share and then in 2017 I, i think i was a contrarian in the sense that i was just not as excited <laughs> about the altcoins as a lot of other people uh even 2016 with ethereum and so um, I think now the sentiment is turning more towards like, oh, you know, it's only Bitcoin that matters. And, and, and while I think that's maybe by and large true, I still think even if, you know, Bitcoin gets a long term dominance of 80 percent, that's still. And, but if we assume that that's going to be, you know, multi trillion dollar value, say that Bitcoin eventually captures uh, two trillion dollars. Well, that means that there's still <clears throat> uh, two to four hundred billion dollar worth of opportunity left in the altcoin space. So I don't want to just throw that out and say, "Oh, you know, we don't have to pay attention to that market at all." Like that is going to be a battle um, for the next ten years. Is like who is going to be in the top ten altcoins? Because I don't believe, you know, it's a free world. Like everybody, there's going to be niches. There's going to be reasons why people want to have some of these other assets. Um, I, I, the question is more like, how big is that 
that slice going to be in the pie? Um, and, and, but, but I mean, to the gist of what you're saying, like, I, I do think Bitcoin is by far the most mature platform It's becoming more and more clear that we can do asset issuance on Bitcoin. So ICOs are coming, uh, to Bitcoin, to the Bitcoin platform, uh, much better privacy, much better to financialize. So that means that if you want to build an institutional product on Bitcoin, it's by far the best candidate to do that. If you want to do it on Ethereum, for example, even just trying to answer the question in your prospectus, like what is Ethereum? Like we, our asset is 100% backed by Ethereum. Okay, so what is that? What if Ethereum forks? What is it then? Um, you know, what if the properties of Ethereum change? Like how do you deal with that? Like just all kind of, what if Ethereum turns from a commodity today into a security tomorrow? Like all that is possible. And it's kind of a, it's kind of a nightmare for, for these firms who, who are trying to build reliable long-term products. And that's a lot less uh, problematic with Bitcoin because it's it's so much more stable and uh, and and all the things that people accuse it of being, but like slow and and um, uh, not subject to a lot of change. All of a sudden, that is becoming an asset, or at least it's being recognized as an asset. Uh, and so it's more like Bitcoin is the tortoise in the race, and a lot of these other coins are more like the hares who are not, you know don't have very solid architecture. Why wow, Bitcoin's so much simpler. Uh, yeah, I mean, its basic function is very simple, and, uh, and, 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 but at the same time, you can build on top of it. So you can, if you want more functionality, you just build a new layer on top of it. So yeah, I agree. It's, it's, it's a lot more straightforward. So working through your, because there's kind of like six key points before you get to the conclusion, but in your first key point, I'm going to backtrack a bit to what you said earlier, but you talked about blockchain analysis indicating undervaluation and the start of accumulation, but this is based on your fundamental value thesis, which it is a store of value. Yeah, of course. Any kind of valuation analysis is always going to presuppose some kind of fundamental analysis and, and a fundamental conclusion. So yeah, like our fundamental analysis is Bitcoin is a store of value and it's gradually becoming more and more a store of value, but then it, it oscillates uh, in these cycles. Um, and then the question is, well, when does Bitcoin have fair value or when is it over or undervalued? And that's what we're trying to answer because investors want to know when do we, when do we get in? When do we want to take some profits? Those are the practical questions that investors ask. And it's funny because undervalue or overvalue seems to be indicated by the behavior of people less so than the price. The price is the result of the behavior, but the behavior indicates overvalue or undervalue. So when everybody's going crazy and CNBC is reporting that the price is now 15K and 20K and people are FOMOing in, it's overvalued, but mainly because of the behavior of people. And then the price drops because of that. Yeah, if you could measure the the average understanding, that would be a great uh, valuation indicator. If you could have a way to quantify, um, you know, of all the people that own Bitcoin today, how many of them actually kind of understand what it is on a very basic level. And so you'll see in periods of like mania in 2017, most people don't have a clue what it is. And so, of course, if something happens that they didn't expect, they'll they'll just scare away and sell. And so gradually the market gets more and more educated about what it is but we can't do that so we always have to like approximate it by by various other things but so it's it's in a way this educational process that we're witnessing and that's yeah you're right i mean it's it's in a way driven by price but um but it's not fundamentally what makes something overvalued um in in uh, at least there's different ways to look at whether or not something is overvalued and it also seems to me that the cycles are driven by a new influx of people who don't understand enough. And it requires those people to come in and join in the market and help boost the price and increase demand. And it feels like then during that cycle, one or two things happens, but most new people come in and will probably get burnt in some way. And it's whether they then sit and educate themselves, they can survive a bear market to go through another cycle, or whether they leave the market. But it's almost like the whales need these essentially retail buyers to come in uneducated and just become part of this. Well, yes, that's true. Although I do think that you know, there are savvy retail investors too who just say, okay, well, a lot is happening here. Um, let me just buy a little bit and kind of see how it goes. Dip my toe in it. And then they see, and I, I had a friend like that when in um, 
in early 2013, she saw the price go from like $30 to $250. And she was like, man, I need to, I need to get some exposure to this. So she bought a little bit and then it crashed down to $80, but she was in the driver's seat, right? She never sold. And she then saw that eventually the price go a lot higher. So, so, you know, that, that, in a way, the price did its work to her. Like it signaled, like, "Hey, something's happening," um, and and so you don't want to throw the sink at it. Uh, you just m- maybe want to buy a little bit to get an idea. And so, I think maybe a lot of that also happened at uh, like Thanksgiving of 2017. Like, you know, the kids were talking about their Bitcoin profits, and then the uncles and the grandfathers, maybe hopefully for them, only bought a little bit to um to get familiar with it or at least you know they they heard the conversation and then a year later um they they see our report quoted in their investment newsletter and then they're like oh this bitcoin thing maybe it really is not dead i'll tell you the most important lesson i think i learned during the whole kind of last couple of years now and it's a fundamental shift in the way i've started to think about things in that i lost a huge amount of dollar value but actually I'm more upset about the Bitcoin value I've lost than the dollar value. You know, by trading shit coins, you know, I probably dropped 80% in terms of my Bitcoins I held as well. I only hold Bitcoin now. I sold off every single shit coin I have, every single altcoin. And now I'm in that position where I've got a base level of Bitcoin. If I don't lose it, I don't get hacked or I don't spend it, my Bitcoin value never drops. And I don't care so much now about the dollar movements. If it goes up, great. But if I accumulate some more Bitcoin, someone gives me a tip, you know, or I buy some, my Bitcoin value will always go up. It's something I've become really comfortable with, but it's kind of taken me a whole cycle to realize that. Is that something that you have experienced or you've experienced from others? Yeah, like thinking in Bitcoin is 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 very powerful and it takes time. It's it's a it's a difficult it's I remember when when I was a kid and we converted from Belgian francs to the euro, it's kind of it's it's this mental switch where you have to just have a different denominator in your head when you think about things and not always convert back. Uh, so I think it's it's a little similar. Um, it, but then of course there's this you know it's it's a lot more as well because the the nature of Bitcoin is so different. And so um, thinking in terms of Bitcoin I think is important and and it also allows you to make some projections in the future where just the fact that you know there are already less than 20 million bitcoin that will ever be in circulation just of it's probably about 3 million bitcoins that are lost so right now there's maybe between 13 and 14 million bitcoin in circulation and if you look in the world like well there's only 20 million millionaires in the world so by definition uh not every millionaire in the world can ever hold one bitcoin so that's kind of interesting that if you if you have one Bitcoin or even point one Bitcoin, that puts you in, in a very small minority in the world, no matter where the price of Bitcoin goes. So I think that's appealing. That allows you to, with you know relatively little money, just secure that position. Um, and then it's all about just making sure your coins don't get stolen and things like that. So yeah, I think you know I think that's very very powerful. All right. Well, listen. Going back to your blockchain analysis. So you noticed that November 18 was the capitulation period where the drop from six down to just above 3k happened and the unrealized losses doubled in a few weeks. You also noticed the pattern from Google that the buy Bitcoin sentiment had dropped. You obviously do value that Google measure. Yeah, like, I mean, it's not something that I would lean on fundamentally. It's just something that I I look at just to you know, to see whether or not it confirms our our suspicion, um, and so it's it's a, it's obviously obviously it's a lagging indicator. Like if you if you want to predict the price tomorrow, you don't want to look at what Google Trends does, um, <clears throat> but but it does kind of reflect where the retail market's mind is. And in order to find a bottom in a bear market, retail has to be out. Like they have to be they have to be done. They have to hate it or just not care anymore. And so that was where we looked at Google to see if if, if that was confirmed. And yeah, I mean, the the, the interest rates, uh, or sorry, the interest was um, as low as in March 2017 um, when Bitcoin was below 1500. So, so I think it's picked up, of course, with the Bitcoin price doubling recently. But um, but that's important, I think, to to 
you know, the bottom of a bear market will only happen when when retail is not around. Right. Okay. Like when the James James Altucher when he doesn't sell any more newsletters, that's when you want to get in. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And also in November, you noticed that seventy thousand Bitcoin days were destroyed between the fourteenth and the sixteenth. What are Bitcoin days? Yeah. So that's a concept goes back to twenty eleven. Uh, somebody came up with that. So the idea is that if you hold on to one Bitcoin for one day, you create one quote unquote Bitcoin day. And then if you hold on to that coin for 100 days, well, then you've saved up 100 Bitcoin days. And then if you send it to someone, you move the coin, 100 Bitcoin days are destroyed. And so you can, you can follow all the Bitcoins on the ledger and then see how many uh, destroyable days are there, how many days are there saved up in the system, so to speak. And then you can start measuring like, oh, well, so... Uh, we've seen a lot of old coins move, so that means a lot of Bitcoin days are destroyed. So it's like a way to measure liveliness of Bitcoin. Next up, I talked to Tua more about his report, but before that, I've got a message from my show sponsors. So firstly, let's talk about Dropbit, my new sponsor. I've got to say, this has been a great relationship from day one. I'm using the app regularly, and actually, they are also sponsoring my party out at Consensus in New York. So massive thanks to that. Got a party on, got a bunch of people coming. We're going to have some drinks. We're going to sing. We're going to dance and hopefully give some Bitcoin to some people. But if you want to check out Dropbit, I recommend you should. It's the only mobile app I'm now using for Bitcoin. You know what? I didn't even use a Bitcoin app previously on my mobile. I had one. I just wasn't regularly using it. And just through the habit of having the Dropbit app and sending people Bitcoin, I've now gone into a regular habit. So that was super cool. I recommend you check it out. It's a great way to send Bitcoin to other people. They've got a whole bunch of cool features of different ways you can send people Bitcoin. It's available for iPhone and Android. You just need to head over to dropbit.app to find out more, which is D-R-O-P-B-I-T dot app. That's dropbit.app, which is D-R-O-P-B-I-T dot app. Also, I want to talk about my amazing client, BlockFi. Talked about them in the intro. Talked about them for months. I'm going to be meeting up with them next week in New York. We're going to be talking about what they've got planned for the rest of the year so I can present some of that back to you. But they do have two successful products out there right now. They have crypto back loans and they've got crypto interest accounts. As I said, I've signed up for the crypto interest accounts now. I put 20% of my Bitcoin in. I've started receiving interest and that was super interesting. It's not for everyone. I do recommend if you are interested in checking out, you do your own research and also listen to my interview with Zach Prince, which is available on my SoundCloud, where he answers a whole bunch of questions about it. But I'm using it. I'm enjoying it. And if you are interested in finding out more, then head over to BlockFi.com, which is B-L-O-C-K-F-I.com. That is BlockFi.com, which is B-L-O-C-K-F-I.com. And lastly... As I mentioned, I'm off to Consensus next week and I'm working with Coindesk. They've been helping me plan some of my interviews. They've given me a space to do some, which is super cool. I'm also looking forward to some of the talks for some of the people who's going to be there. We've got John Carvalho, Christian Decker, Alex Gladstein, super interesting people who've all been on the podcast. So I can't wait to see their talks. But are you going? Are you heading out to Consensus? Do you want to? Have you not got a ticket? Well, I've got a discount for you from Consensus. If you would like $300 off, then please head over to consensus2019.com. That's Consensus with a U, which is C-O-N-S-E-N-S-U-S-2019.com and use the discount code BitcoinDid300. All right, well, 2019's been kind of a steady year, last couple of months things are starting to improve, but you kind of put your marker in the sand and said, okay, start 2019 is kind of the official start of accumulation. Feeling pretty confident about that. I mean, you know, we don't have a crystal ball, but we just think that all these indicators, like all the institutional gates are opening. It's it's just incredible. Like BACT is coming out. So that's the New York Stock Exchange is going to have their own Bitcoin platform. Um, we have Fidelity that's pretty much live um, I mean, these are huge platforms that are making it possible for these funds to finally, after 10 years, get some real exposure to the market. Uh, and we're seeing family offices are, are actually accumulating. Um, and then that event in November, I think, is just such a, an important psychological marker like that, that um, 
that that capitulation like there was so much hope and positivism before that and then just it just all got slashed and and we saw so many coins move in that month not only coinbase moved coins but but other coins as well um i just think that to me that reminded of reminded me of what happened when bitcoin dipped below 600 and then below 400 in uh, 2014 like a lot of people thought and me included that 400 might be the bottom but then it went all the way down to briefly 150 dollars even uh, in 2015 and so uh to me this this represents something similar like it doesn't mean that we can't go down again but at least psychologically we've moved from hope over um capitulation to now accumulation how much of this kind of crazy ICO phase and altcoin market of 2017 do you think impacted Bitcoin and impacted the price drop? And do you believe without such a crazy market in 2017 that the Bitcoin bear market, do you think it would have been shorter or shallower? Because it felt like a lot of money got distributed into all these other projects that eventually just went to nothing. Yeah, I, I remember I actually re-listened to a Real Vision uh, video that I made. So this that's like a Netflix for investors. So I make some videos for them sometimes. Uh, so I made one in, I think it was in early 2016 when Bitcoin was like $400. Um, and I was just trying to project like how high the market might go. And I thought, you know, I think I said like $3,000 is is a reasonable target, a 10x from, from where we are here. Um, and I... I in 2017, in the summer, I really did feel uncomfortable when we went above 5,000. I was like, man, this is this, uh, you know, Uber drivers were talking to me about doubling their coins. And, 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 and so, yeah, I think that the ICO phenomenon really, uh, it threw a lot of um, oil on the fire. And, uh, and, and Bitcoin was a funding mechanism. I mean, people always talk about Ethereum, like, oh, well, obviously Ethereum did very well because of the ICOs. But Bitcoin was a funding mechanism to get into a lot of the exchanges to buy tokens. Um, it was the first thing that people probably bought. Um, so yeah, I think that the Bitcoin mania was uh, was definitely driven by the ICOs. Also, like it just it just made it. There's there's so many more stories. I think bull markets are always driven by stories, and so. There were just so many more stories available for people to get excited about uh, and, and just as an excuse to buy more Bitcoin. So, yeah, I think um, and, and likewise, the demise of the ICOs is, is, um, is, is then pushing the price down further than it would have gone. Uh, so we, we if you look at the drawdowns every time during every cycle, they've gotten more shallow, like in the, the first Bitcoin cycle. Uh, we went down 92% from the all-time high in, in, um, in 2011. And then the next, um, the next peak, um, we dropped 85%. And you would think like the third peak, well, we would drop less because Bitcoin is maturing, it's growing, it has uh, slightly less volatility over time. But we still went down 84% from the all-time high. So from almost 20,000 to uh, about around 3,000. And I think the reason for that is because it was such a crazy mania that it just went higher than it otherwise would have gone. And so that's why it also had to go lower to, to correct. I worry that the next phase will be dominated by the IEO, which to me is just another ICO in a different name with the same faults, same problems and same risks for investors. I've seen that float around. I think uh, Bitfinex is now doing an IEO. I actually don't know what it stands for. Um... I actually don't know. Investment. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. But uh, I've read a lot about the Ocean Protocol one that's already 80% down. It just seems like it's history repeating itself. Well, I mean, to be fair, I think that there is clearly a need for different ways to offer equity to investors and, and, and more directly to the market. Um, and there's a lot of entrenchment that's happened over the years. And I think that that, you know, somehow issued assets are going to become a thing and 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 bitcoin could be kind of a, a backbone to platforms like that i mean uh, even in 2012 there were um bitcoin denominated stock markets like you could go to gobse and buy shares in a mining company in china it didn't matter where you are because of bitcoin you could you could trade those shares 
So I think that there is something there where uh, equity and startups, they want to have access to global markets. Uh, it's just, a, you know, the question is, how is it going to happen? Uh, and, and on what platform is it going to happen? Uh, and, and in the end, there's still startups. So they're still going to have a failure rate of, of probably plus 90%. Yeah. All right. Well, then let's go back to your report. So the next point was, does your blockchain analysis fit reality? You talked about that in 2016, 2017, the market climbed a wall of worry where dominance decline shifted in favor of altcoins and ICOs. And then I started to look at how that kind of drove the market up. But actually, since the market's dropped back down, so many other cool things are happening. And Marty Bent put out a tweet uh, the things that didn't exist last time Bitcoin hit $5,200. He said Cash App wasn't selling Bitcoin. Ameritrade wasn't offering BTC contracts. Fidelity wasn't custodian for institutions. E-Trade wasn't in the fray. You know, he talked about a whole bunch of things. It feels like we're such a different place now. Yeah, I mean, and so it's the battle of the bulls and the bears. So so the bulls are seeing all this and they're like, man, this, we're in such a better place. But then the bears or the sellers they are looking at how many Bitcoin are still left in these ICO treasuries. Uh, how many more Bitcoin exchanges could get in trouble now that regulators are really on their tail. And so that's where, I, that's where to me, it makes sense to think about Bitcoin trading in a range. Uh, at least as long as we don't break above 6,500, I still consider this to be accumulation. Because uh, like, like you say, like it's totally, those things are happening. That's totally valid. They're long-term very positive evolutions, but we may have some, you know, some some uh, dirt to get rid of that was that we've inherited from this crazy bull market, and and also like some some maturation that needs to happen still. And often markets mature in in quite painful ways, like you know, uh, like my Gox failed, and 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 so so that's something that I'm still wary of. We could still see. Um, bad things happen to to because we were talking earlier about concentration of bitcoin i think it's not so much that the actual owners of the bitcoin are, are concentrated but a lot of bitcoin are uh, concentrated in exchanges who are kind of pooling that and and of course they, they have their role and that's that's efficient but it does create uh risk as well like if those if those coins are touched or stolen or or if a regulator cracks down and freezes them or something like that then that could really spook the market the other interesting thing there is you talk about trading in a range, but my experience here with Bitcoin is thinking, well, if we push towards 6,500, I could just see another round of the FOMO beginning. I could see press articles that coming out saying, oh, Bitcoin's recovered or Bitcoin's doubled. It, it seems like the volatility of Bitcoin might come back because one of the things I heard recently, I can't remember the number, but the amount of Bitcoin that is available to trade on a daily basis actually isn't that high. It's just the same coins kind of moving back and forth. I think somebody told me it's around a million Bitcoin that are actively regularly traded. Now, I've got to say that number might be wrong. But, you know, if we start to see some positive sentiment, you could very quickly see how six and a half thousand could suddenly fly back to 10,000. Of course, like anything can happen. And, and we I mean, Bitcoin is a secular bull market. So it's been in a bull market since inception. So I never want to discount bullish scenarios. Like that's why I don't like to short Bitcoin. But on the other hand, I would say, you know, an argument for why we may not be on the rocket ship to the moon yet is just that usually markets don't bottom in a V shape. Like they usually bottom while trading in a range and you have this bull bear battle going on for a while until the bears are just exhausted. They don't have any, any more coins to sell. And so, yeah. And so I, I don't, you know, that's why I, I just... I'm not ready to say, yes, we are in a new bull market. Uh, I do think we're definitely in the last phase of, of the bear market, for sure. All right. Okay, let's go on to point three, clues from historical data, Bitcoin's history of price volatility. Do you think it's at all risky to use past behavior as like a future indicator? Because, you know, the old saying says, never use past performance as a future indicator. Or do you think it's pretty reliable now? No, I mean, you have to be careful. Like, it, you always have to keep in mind that, Historical data is going to give you hints of, of what may happen and patterns that may be, you know, but it's in the end, it's always a probability game. It's just patterns allow you to, to, to say things, um, to, to kind of 
you know, consider outcomes with uh, a higher probability than others to make that distinction so that you're not totally blind. Um, but yeah, I mean, obviously nothing ever perfectly repeats itself. And it's actually, you see a lot of uh, Bitcoin uh, technical analysis that that's, uh, people use these fractals where like, oh, look, the shape of this graph looks exactly like this market in that you know time. And oh, this is exactly the, like the NASDAQ. And so now we're going to follow the same pattern going forward. It's, you know, that's, that's, that's dangerous. So, so uh, what we try to do is, is to not rely on a single metric or a single source of data, for example, not just on the price. Uh, we, we look at the, the, behavior of uh, long-term holders, for example, like, like we did earlier, we look at um, what kind of sentiment might be happening. We look at retail activity. We look at like volatility is part of that. So I think that's, that is a reasonable way to, to think about markets is, is you look at it from many different angles and then, and then you make a, you make an analysis. Um, and, and, and the nice thing about markets is that if you get it roughly right, you do get rewarded. Like if you, if you manage your risk in a, in a, in a good way and you get it roughly right, like tops and bottoms and things like that, then the market is going to be very generous with you. Of course, if you don't manage your risk and you, you do hundred X leverage on BitMEX, <laughs> then you're going to get wrecked. Right. <laughs> so you have yeah. to be careful. But not everybody's cut out to be a trader as well. Most people should probably just buy some and hold. Like people ask me and I'm like, look, if you're going to do this, if you're going to buy Bitcoin, buy it, hold it for 10 years and forget about it. Do not try and play it because as soon as you start playing it, you're going to, you know, people who really know what they're doing, who've been trading for years and a lot of them lose money as well. So my kind of view on it is always just come in and, and put it away for a long period of time, maybe a decade. That's great advice. I agree with that. I would say that even if you are a long-term holder and you've dug a hole in your yard and your Bitcoin is sitting in there and, and they're not, you know, they're extremely hard to extract. Uh, so you're not going to be tempted to sell. Even then, I think keeping an eye on where the market is going and, and reading some analysis, I think at least for you to psychologically consider different scenarios, I think that can be helpful to just have less stress when it actually does happen. Like I remember when Bitcoin was at 20,000, I did the mental exercise of like, what if it goes down to a thousand and it stays there for two years? How am I gonna feel? What am I gonna do? Um, and so it, in a way it's like, it's like you're like hardening yourself for these, I usually do it with bad scenarios, but I think it's even helpful to do with positive scenarios too, just to kind of, you know, because this market, I mean, it just beats you up. Like it, it just, it's its so volatile. I think it's its kind of, you know, this mental gymnastics may be a good idea, even for people who don't plan on selling at all. It's just so that they're prepared for, because everyone is always calculating like, oh, my Bitcoin is worth this much. It's worth that much. It's human nature. Like you, you just, you know, you want to keep track of of your, your portfolio. Um, so yeah, that would be my reason to still, follow some analysis, even though you're never selling. Do you think there's many of these cycles left? Or do you see there's going to hit a point where Bitcoin does become a lot more stable over a multi-year period? Yeah, I mean, I, I think the cycles are slowing down. They will keep slowing down until they um, they hit, you know, Bitcoin hits saturation and they're going to just lengthen and sync up with long-term commodity cycles in general, like gold and, and things like that. Uh, and, and, and that'll be in relation to its, its, its um, market capitula yeah, cap capitalization, sorry. Um, so that if, we're, if we have a $2 trillion market, that is probably gonna have slower cycles than if it's uh, only a hundred $100 billion market like today. Um, and so if it's, if, if Bitcoin becomes twice or, or four times as valuable as gold, maybe Bitcoin cycles are going to be a bit slower than gold as well. I can quote you on this because you said as Bitcoin matures into a globally traded commodity, it seems reasonable to expect its cycles to continue lengthening until eventually they're on par with the multi-decade cycles visible in commodities like copper or gold. So you see that. And I guess I would also then reflect a point Murad made in his interview with Pomp, where he said, you can't go from zero to a global commodity worth trillions of dollars without volatility. Exactly. And that's just the way you get there. Like, I mean, a startup currency, how in the world is that not going to be volatile? So, so that's like, 
uh, I think um, Michael Goldstein has pointed this out, is that a lot of the critics and, and Bitcoin detractors, they, they, they fall into this nirvana fallacy where they, they paint this perfect picture of what a currency should be. And then they say, oh, well, Bitcoin fails to, make, you know, to meet that standard. Therefore, it can never become something like that. That's, you know, that's the nirvana fallacy where um, you, you create an impossible standard and then you just, you're like a teacher who's giving it, you know, whatever, a D minus or something. It's just, you know, failed. Sorry. <laughs> but that's not how it works. Like, you know, uh, markets change and assets change and, and, and uh, ecosystems mature. And that's what's happening with Bitcoin. But do you not feel like there's post-rationalization there by some people because they're actually just a little bit bitter that they've missed out on what is probably the best asset they could have invested in in modern time? They're like doubling down. Yeah, that's why you just have to look at the fundamentals. Like you can't, if you always base your analysis on other people's opinions, you're always going to be blind. You just have to actually look at the facts and actually look at the technology um, and then of course, people's behavior is important for like relative valuation, like where are we in the cycle and things like that. But in my opinion, fundamentals is all about facts. Like you can't just, you know, it's, it's the market is not, it's not an election, right? It's, it's things, things that win that nobody, like most of the technologies we use today, one, there was a time when nobody believed that this could ever work. So markets have a great ability to prove people wrong in the long run. And volatility's dropped recently, you've said. So this tends to coincide with phases of consolidation, apathy, and accumulation. Yeah, like there's no, I mean, there's no retail gambler so much anymore. And so that's why the, you know, it starts to trade in a range because it's more like professional traders that are ping-ponging, you know, oh, once it hits this resistance, now I'm selling. And then, oh, now it hits the support and now I'm buying. And so they kind of, you know, kick the ball back and forth rather than, in retail time, like retail traders don't care about these technical indicators. So they just, you know, they kind of go berserk buying or selling. All right. So let's move on to point four, risk analysis. You broke this down into four areas and you've already touched on this. Like, so the first point you talked about is Bitcoin exchange hacks and failures. And we don't have the risk of a Mt. Gox level hack because you talked about them having the percent of Bitcoin they had, but also the large exchanges now are really pretty hot on their security. I think most of the hacks we tended to hear about, they don't tend to be from a Coinbase or a Kraken. They tend to be from much smaller exchanges. And I also think that's naturally leading investors to stay away from some of these exchanges. Like I know myself, there's no point risking yourself with a small unknown exchange where you don't know who owns it or where it's run from. But you think that's a very important point. Yeah, because in my opinion, brand, sure, you can have an exchange that's been around for five years, but the way, you know, <laughs> whether or not something is secure is always in hindsight. Like you, 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 you of course, five years, it, it's not meaningless to be, to, to have survived this wild market for five years. Um, but it also doesn't guarantee that tomorrow there's not going to be a hack. Um and uh, and some of these exchanges like Coinbase, they have five percent of all Bitcoin under management. Um, so that that's very significant. That means that's you know a significant amount of people have meaningful amounts of Bitcoin on that exchange. Um, and so it's just you know I think a lot of retail investors uh, or new investors uh, don't really understand that um, it's different from having dollars in the bank where there is uh, the Federal Reserve as a lender of last resort, like. If your coins get hacked, they're gone. It's over. And it could be it could be because of your, you know, you're using SMS based 2FA or something like that. It could not be entirely the exchange's fault. Uh, but just, you know, when looking at credible catalysts for lower prices, to me that's it's still number one. Like it's still the the risk that I think the most people are underestimating. I mean, I don't think people saw this problem with Bitfinex coming, but we are looking at a serious problem, like a, an exchange with a $850 million shortage of cash that then cycled it into uh, Tether, you know, and then, and then with regulators on their tails, like, I mean, I'm not questioning the integrity of Bitfinex. Like I, I don't, but, but it is clear that they are in a bit, you know, they're in hot water and, and that regulators somehow don't like what they're doing, at least for the moment. Um, so that's something that I, I wish I had mentioned as well is like regulatory pressure 
there's lots of um, 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 treasuries, ICO treasuries that could be forced to liquidate and just, you know, to repay their investors uh, and just have to sell their entire inventory. So in a way, those are also holders that could be forced to liquidate still. So it's just, you know, and, and I did that survey um, in, in, in the summer of 2017, asking these experts like, hey, oh, sorry, summer 2018, asking these experts like, well, what, what do you think about the space? Are we going to see serious hacks in the next two years? And, and um, you know, several of them thought that um, 20 to 30 percent of uh, Bitcoin exchanges are going to be meaningfully hacked uh, before 2020 is over. So that is like, that's not, I mean, I don't, I don't joke around. I mean, that is, that's important information to me. Like these are some of the top Bitcoin custody experts uh, in the world that have serious concerns about the state of the ecosystem still. So anyway, that I, I don't want to like, you know, be Dr. Doom or fear monger. It's just like, I think this is the most significant risk. If you want to think about lower prices, I think this could be, this is a credible driver of that. You also mentioned BIP33 mm-hmm. and regards to institutions might reject the privacy side. Do you think this is because there's going to be a fear from regulators? Yeah. I mean, it's more by proxy, like, you know, uh, uh, Bitcoin companies might fear the reaction of regulators to certain changes in the protocol. And then they would start pressuring developers or miners to not accept a particular change, especially one who um, would add a lot of privacy to the, the, the core layer. Because part of why regulators are comfortable with Bitcoin is that there's all this uh, forensics that can be done to figure out where the money comes from. Um, so I don't, I don't know if it will happen, but, but it, it's a possible controversy. It's a po- it could be the final fork controversy. And it's not going to be the death of Bitcoin if BIP33 doesn't get approved. It'll just, uh, it'll just be merged on, on uh, another level. It'll be in side chains or whatever. Um, but, but eventually Bitcoin will ossify and some kind of, and we've already seen how dangerous it is to propose contentious forks. Um, with uh, the whole, you know, Bitcoin Cash debacle, and before that, um, uh, what was it again? B two X and and all these others, where, where miners were um, rolling their muscles and and trying to cajole the community into accepting certain changes. Um, yeah, it's something to keep an eye on, but I don't see it as a big concern. All right, key point five. You talk about accumulation and where it leads us, and it was a very interesting point that you said. Some of the people who've got kind of realized losses right now as the price goes up they might start selling early just to kind of almost get back to kind of like a break even point is this a pattern you've seen before yeah i I mentioned it earlier where you know if we if we get closer to the previous all-time high that's when a lot of people are like you know psychologically they're like oh man i'm break even again let's let's make sure that i at least cash in that value like that i don't I don't lose that again. And so I think a lot of investors are like that, where if if a lot of people, for example, um, bought Bitcoin at $6,000 because they thought the bottom was in, um, they have those Bitcoin and they've been underwater ever since, right? We're now at close to 6,000, but not 6,000 yet. So that's what creates resistance in the market in, in, in the price if a lot of people accumulated at 6,000 and then we went below it for a long time and then finally we recover, a significant amount of those people might choose to sell. And that means that even with the same amount of demand, the price is not going to go above 6,000 for a while. Um, so those are, you know, that's why technical analysis, in, in my opinion, is not complete bunk. Like <laughs> if a lot, of, a lot of buying was happening at certain levels, then that has repercussions down the road. Okay, and before we get on to the conclusions, the last thing you talked about, point six, was the fundamental drivers of the Bitcoin price. Now, look, we've touched some of this, the financialization. We've talked about backed and custody. But there's a couple of other interesting things you talked about. You talked about bottom-up scaling. And really, you're talking about the growth of the infrastructure of Bitcoin. We don't just have the base chain now. We have side chains. You know, Lightning is there available to use. What this says to me is it's increasing the utility of Bitcoin. Right. 
I would add to that, it's increasing the utility of Bitcoin as a censorship resistant, decentralized platform. Because that's what I mean with bottom up, like it's grassroots, even if all the governments in the world crack down on it, this is real progress. Like the code is there, you can run a full node on your Android, it doesn't matter where you are in the world. So that to me is really important because it's like, it's like, you know, <laughs> if we go into a regulatory holocaust, that is the stuff that's still going to be standing. So that's important, I think, to keep track of. And you also talk about millennials, which I also found interesting in that, I guess the point you're making here is Bitcoin will become something that's a little bit more native to how millennials have experienced life and experienced adoption of technology. And you think that's important? Yeah. And, and this is actually, uh, I mean, we got the idea initially from talking to Tom Lee from Fundstrat in New York, and uh, because they, you know, they, they do a lot of their research um, in, they do a lot of research into the generations, the, the how, how markets are driven by, uh, especially if, if a new generation all of a sudden gets more purchasing power then something that was very fringy or nerdy can really become mainstream because they, you know, they're all buying it. Um, and so the millennials, interestingly, um, are now today they um, they have less purchasing power than Generation X, for example, and they also have less generation uh, purchasing power um, than the Boomers. Even though I think I'm trying to think how old they are on average now, uh, probably in their mid to mid twenties to to early thirties, that's where the millennials are. So I think the top earning power. Uh, that that only happens in your in your mid 40s i think that's where you hit the peak so that's why if you look at projections in 2029 millennials are going to overtake uh generation x as well as the boomers in terms of purchasing power and so that's interesting if you know that already since the beginning millennials were some of the biggest advocates of bitcoin uh they were early buyers they're still buying um and i think it's because they lived through the 2008 crisis, they don't trust banks. Uh, and, and when they were in college, they were using BitTorrent to download things. So they know that this, they know how powerful these peer to peer protocols can be. And they also understand how important and powerful open source software is. Whereas I think, you know, a lot of the boomers or Generation X, to them, software is like, oh, that's the thing that Microsoft creates rather than software is something that can you know, in a Wikipedia type way can be like organically um, created and then just used by the world. Like it does, it's not something that's run by a corporation necessarily. Okay, interesting. All right, well, listen, let's get on to the conclusion. I think firstly, disclaimer, this is not financial advice, right? Exactly. <laughs> okay, the first bit I wanted to point out is that you identify that lower prices are possible. And that's highlighted with the risks you've identified, you know, an exchange could be hacked. And you even recognized the Mt. Gox coins, the 140,000 or 160,000 coins, which are going to be made available once the legal case with Peter Vicenis is concluded and civil rehabilitation is done. That could lead to a mass sell-off. So there are certain things that could lead to lower prices. At the same time, you also said the fundamentals are gaining momentum. So I think what you're saying is that there is a risk of lower prices, but I just don't believe you think it's going to happen. It's always relative. So there's always, no matter when, there's always a risk of lower prices. What we're trying to argue is that the risk of lower prices is less now than it has been in quite a long time. Uh, that because of all the selling that's happened, because of um, everything that's that's occurred through, throughout these the cycle, uh, we think the risk of significantly lower prices is um, is low, and the the possibility of reward is is much much higher than it's been in a long time. So that's the whole point of the of the report is to. To, to make the case that the risk reward ratio of Bitcoin is now extremely attractive. So, because you always, there's always risk, but, but um, the potential rewards are uh, quite extraordinary given how strong the fundamentals are, given um, just, just all the things that are in the pipeline that are coming up. And, um, and, and also just given the price level of Bitcoin compared to where it was, uh, you know, a year and a half ago. So, there's lots of potential coming. There's lots of opportunity. As you said, fundamentals are gaining momentum. And 
I'm just going to quote you from it. The stage is set for mass market adoption over the next five years. And I guess if some people are thinking about whether to get involved in Bitcoin, you know, now is definitely a good time because the market's probably going to look very different in five years. Yeah, exactly. And I think that it's also you send a signal to the market. Like if you become like if you think about getting professionally involved, for example, the fact that you are interested in an asset, even if it's down 70, 80 percent, that means that you you have studied some of the fundamentals. Uh, you, you're willing to just to grind and create value. Um, and, and we've seen it, too, with content creators in the space and, and analysts and, you know, people who 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 really uh, acquire the skills in the bear market um, that that does get rewarded over time. Whereas if you just get in at the last phase of the bull market, you are probably going to be identified, even if you're not, as an opportunist. So, so And also people don't have time. And, and you know, once the bull market gets into full swing, uh, there's way, way less time available from the, the other professionals in the space. Um, so yeah, both as an investment uh, or as a, getting professionally involved. I think this is just a fantastic time. The only thing I did think that was perhaps missing, and you might have an answer for this, is you don't really talk about the halvening. Yeah, I I, I don't discount it. I think that uh, it's it's a significant evolution. If we're going to drop from, what is it now, 4.5% inflation to slightly under 2%, um, new coins being generated every year. I think that's significant. Um, but I... I, and I've seen a lot of analysis kind of argue that, oh, it, it's like clockwork and it's such a strong driver of, of adoption. I, I wanted to de-emphasize it. So that's why it didn't make it into the report. Um, I, I, I probably should have added it to the section about drivers. Um, I don't, I think it deserves that because it's, you know, it's still significantly less coins that will be created. But I, I like the idea that the report stands on its own. And so in a way, it's like a bonus argument. It's like, yeah, and, and by the way, supply is also going to get cut in half. All right. Well, listen, it was a great report. Like I said, I've read it twice. I've, I feel very optimistic about the market. So thank you as ever for coming on the show. It's always great to have you on too. And I look forward to catching up with you again soon in person. Can you let people know where they can find the report and how they can stay in touch with you? Yeah, so the report I've just stickied on my Twitter page. So if you just Google my name, uh, you'll see it as the first tweet. And if not, you can just Google for Bitcoin in heavy accumulation by Adamant Capital. And yeah, I'm, I'm usually on Twitter. I also write on Medium. That's pretty much where you can find me. Cool. Well, I'll share that all out in the show notes. And thank you for sparing me the time on your weekend because I know your time's valuable. Thanks again, too. Always happy to chat. Thanks, Peter. Okay, so how was that? I think Chu is always great. As I said, that's the third time I've had him on. He can come back on whenever he wants. He's always a great guest. Love talking to him. And I also had the pleasure of having dinner with him in Austin recently. Got to talk to him about Bitcoin for a couple of hours. I learned so much from him. It was super interesting. And I really enjoyed the report. You know, this was my first experience of a bear market. It's been pretty brutal. I screwed up in a number of ways. I've put it publicly out there that, you know, through a bunch of poor decisions that I once had a healthy Bitcoin stack and now that's been heavily depleted. And, you know, I've got to learn from that. But I do only hold Bitcoin now. I've got no interest in holding any other cryptocurrencies. And you know what? One of the interesting side things about that is whenever I used to check my balance, I used to always check the dollar value and the Bitcoin value. I don't check the Bitcoin value and my Bitcoin value never stops. It's actually only going up because I'm stacking sats and everything I do is to grow that portfolio balance. And I think over the space of a few years, especially as I'm not a trader and I don't want to trade, this is a strategy that is definitely going to work for me. And reading the report and listening to Tour, it did help me understand a bit more about how the market plays out. And I would hope that if we do have another bull run, I will play it much better than the last one. I won't screw up like I did and lose a bunch of my Bitcoin. Anyway, definitely looking forward to the feedback on this. I hope you enjoy it. As I always say, if you've got any questions, you can reach out to me. And also a massive thank you to everyone who supports the show. There's always things you can do to support it. It doesn't matter if you want to leave a review, you want to become a patron, you want to become a sponsor. Anything you want to do is super helpful. I'm not going to run through it now because 
I'm rushed for time. I'm heading out to New York for consensus tomorrow, so I've got loads to prepare for that. But if you do want to support the show, head over to my website, whatbitcoindid.com. Click on the support section. Everything you can do is explained there. And as I said, I'm off to consensus tomorrow. I've got so many great interviews planned, some new ones, some people I've never met before. So that's going to be cool. Can't wait to get it out for you. And if you want to reach out to me, my email address is hello at whatbitcoindid.com. And I look forward to hearing from you. 